Apollo's Chariot at Busch Gardens Williamsburg in Virginia was the first Bolger and Mabillard hypercoaster. This coaster regularly places in the top 10 of Amusement Today's Golden Ticket Awards for the best steel roller coaster. But is Apollo's Chariot that good? Find out in this review. In the 1990s, Bolger and Mabillard were one of the hottest commodities in the amusement park industry. The company was wowing the amusement industry with their looping coasters especially their inverted coaster model. Both guests and parks love the coasters for their smoothness, capacity, and reliability. The 1990s were also home to the coaster wars. Parks were constantly building bigger and faster rides. And one genre in particular that was becoming increasingly popular was the hypercoaster. This style of coaster exceeded the 200 foot or 61 meter threshold and featured a series of airtime built camelbacks. As of 1998, there were only three manufacturers willing and able to build a hypercoaster, Aerodynamics, Morgan, and Togo. But everything changed in 1999. Three additional manufacturers started offering hypercoasters, Giovanola, Intamin, and for the sake of this story, Bolger and Mabillard. Both Busch Gardens Williamsburg and Six Flags Great America were early customers for B&M, so it was no surprise they were two parks that purchased their hypercoasters for the 1999 season. Apollo's Chariot would open in March of 1999, just two months before Six Flags Great America's Raging Bull would open. This made Apollo's Chariot the first B&M hypercoaster, and it immediately became one of B&M's most successful coaster models. Their hypercoasters continuously place highly in roller coaster poles and by the number of installations, the hypercoaster has been B&M's second most successful model. They have built 18 worldwide to date, and that includes their mega coasters just under 200 feet and their giga coasters. B&M considers all of these rides part of their hypercoaster model. Apollo's Chariot's opening is also notorious for one of the oddest roller coaster accidents in history. At the bottom of the first drop, a goose flew into Fabio's face. The goose died on impact. Fabio was brought in since Apollo's Chariot is part of the park's Festa Italia area, a land themed to a festival celebrating Marco Polo's return to Italy. When Apollo's Chariot opened, it dominated the skyline of this area. Its 170 foot tall or 52 meter tall lift hill towered over everything in the area. Today, two other roller coasters detract from Apollo's visual impact within the area. You have the new for 2021 Pantheon and Tempesto, the latter of which is placed literally right in front of Apollo's lift hill. However, Apollo's chariot looks just as imposing as ever from outside the park. The ride's layout runs alongside the roadway into the park, so guests have a perfect view of the ride's giant drop and camelbacks poking above the tree line. In fact, this road and the parking lot are your best vantage points to see Apollo's chariot. Very little of this coaster is visible from within Busch Gardens. You can only really see the coaster's lift hill, first drop, and finale from inside the park. Everything else is deep within the woods. And this setting is one of the best aspects of Apollo's Chariot. It's incredible how isolated you feel, even though you're actually quite close to the parking lot. The abundance of trees enhances the ride's sense of speed, and you also pass over the Rhine River twice in your journey. Plus, the terrain is hilly as well. You may have noticed that Apollo's Chariot doesn't actually cross the 200 foot threshold to be considered a hypercoaster in terms of the height. Apollo uses the elevation difference to its advantage, featuring a 210 foot or 64 meter tall drop, which allows it to classify as a hypercoaster. The ride is themed to Apollo, the Greek and Roman god of the sun. Apollo is responsible for pulling the sun across the sky in a celestial horse-drawn chariot. But one day, he allows his son Pathon to pilot the chariot and disaster ensues. First, he travels too high, freezing the earth. Then he travels too low, burning the earth. The wild, erratic motions sound perfect for a hypercoaster loaded with giant camelbacks, don't you think? While the attraction is themed to a very cool epic, the ride itself doesn't have any theming in the queue line or along the ride's course. You just have a narration when you're dispatched, telling you to enjoy your voyage to the sun. And you will hear that audio quite a bit. 
Apollo's chariot is a capacity machine. The ride features three trains, each seating up to 36 guests. The coaster is always running at least two trains, but I often see it running with three when I visit in the summer or on weekends. Even in peak season, I usually never have to wait more than 15 minutes for this coaster. The only time I normally have to wait longer is if I choose to wait a few extra cycles for the front row. But I rarely do that. Apollo's Chariot is unequivocally a back row coaster for me. While you have a superior sense of speed up front, the airtime in the back row is far superior, particularly on the first drop. When Apollo's Chariot opened, it held the record for dropping guests a total of 825 feet or 251 and a half meters over the ride's nine drops. So there are plenty of opportunities to levitate out of your seat. Apollo's Chariot features the traditional B&M hypercoaster trains, and these are some of the best trains in the industry. They are extremely comfortable, and the clamshell restraints offer plenty of room to experience this coaster's airtime. And unlike the B&M hypers found at the Cedar Fair parks, Apollo's Chariot does not have any seat belts. Once secured, you begin with the aforementioned lift hill out of the station. And if you look to your right, you get a fantastic view of Busch Gardens. This is one of the prettiest parks in the world, so I always relish the opportunity to see the park from above. Once you crest the lift hill, you actually don't head right down the drop. All of the B&M coasters built in the 1990s featured pre-drops. These were short little dips between the lift hill and first drop to reduce tension on the chain lift. This is a relatively unique element to have on a hyper coaster, but I really liked having the pre-drop there. For one, it gives you a few extra seconds to appreciate the view. But more importantly, it gives Apollo's chariot some extra speed heading into the first drop, making the airtime even stronger. And this is one of my favorite first drops out there. The drop gives several seconds of sustained and powerful floater airtime. When paired with the visual that you're plunging into the woods above the Rhine River, it's the complete package from both the thrill and visual perspective. Apollo's chariot supposedly pulls 4.1 Gs, which is actually pretty strong. However, I cannot recall a single section of the ride where I experienced G-forces that strong. Apollo's chariot is not about the positive Gs. This coaster is all about sustained floater airtime. And that airtime continues on the monstrous second hill. It offers weak sustained floater airtime up front, and in the back, the airtime is a little bit stronger, but equally as sustained. The pull-up from this drop passes through a short tunnel that offers a fleeting head chopper, and then you rise up into the third hill. This hill does have a trim halfway up, but it rarely engages the train. And if it does, it just slightly taps it. So the front gets another dose of sustained and decent floater airtime over the top. Back row riders get the ride's most powerful airtime on the way down. The drop twists to the left and it offers sustained flejector airtime, particularly if you're on the right side of the train. Then comes the turnaround section. These are always the weakest part of a B&M Hyper for me, and it's no different with Apollo's Chariot. While this section does have a great sense of speed up front, it offers no positive G's or laterals. It just feels like a sterile element to me. You then twist up into the mid-course brake run and weakly rise up out of your seat for a split second. You will then likely get trimmed a bit unless you're riding Apollo on a cooler day. Thankfully, the return run is strong even when it is trimmed. The drop off the mid-course brake run delivers great sustained floater airtime if you're trimmed, and if you're lucky to not get trimmed at all, the initial pop of the drop is stronger and the airtime is more of the flejector variety. That is followed by a sizable drop that sneaks up on you as you plunge back down over the Rhine River. The entrance into this drop gives some decent floater airtime up front, but glorious sustained floater airtime in the back row. You then glide across the water and rise back up the hillside. This hill features the ride's final trim break. If you are untrimmed in the mid-course, you're likely going to get slowed down a bit here. If you were trimmed in the mid-course, the brake will likely not engage the train so the following hill will ride similarly in all conditions. The hill twists to the right at the top, so it's more about the laterals than the airtime. You gently get pulled to the side as you crest this hill, but if you're riding on the left side of the train, you will get some weak lift out of your seat as well that accompanies these laterals. 
You then twist to the left over a small hill that passes over Roman Rapids. This hill delivers a meek pop of airtime up front and some brief but decent floater airtime in the back. But this is another tease, as the ride's following drop is significantly larger. This is the coaster's final drop and it runs alongside the queue line and also features the ride's on-ride photo. It catches a lot of people off guard. Everyone gets another dose of sustained floater airtime on this hill. You then rise up into the brake run, getting one last bit of lift if you're towards the front of the train. And if Apollo's chariot is running three trains, you better be praying they have another train on the course. If Apollo's chariot has stacked, you will abruptly come to a halt. If Apollo's chariot has dispatched the third train on time, or if they're running two trains, you will calmly glide through this brake run, round a corner, and head back towards the station, ending your 4,882 foot or 1,488 meter long journey. Before going into my final score, I want to talk about three other aspects about this coaster. First, the smoothness. Apollo's Chariot is one of the smoothest coasters in the world. Some of the B&M Hypers have developed a bit of a rattle in the valleys, but the original B&M Hyper coaster is still glass smooth, which shows how well Busch Gardens maintains this coaster. I could ride Apollo's Chariot all day. Two, the pacing. Apollo's Chariot's pacing is interesting. While the layout does seem straightforward, the drops do not follow the stereotypical flow. The drops on coasters typically get progressively smaller as they go, particularly on hyper coasters. On Apollo's Chariot, the coaster will randomly mix in these smaller drops that serve as teases before a larger drop. I like how this keeps the rider on their toes. Overall, I think Apollo's Chariot is a pretty well paced coaster if you're in the back row. It may not be as agile as the newer B&M coasters with their shorter trains, but every single one of Apollo's hills delivers in the back row. The only dead spot is the far turnaround. Up front, the pacing isn't quite as strong since the airtime isn't as consistently good hill to hill, but it does offer that superior sense of speed to compensate. Three, the night rides. Apollo's Chariot is one of my favorite night rides. There is zero light along the course and it feels like you're plunging into the abyss on each drop. I always try to visit Bush Gardens when they have a late close for this reason. So what would I rate Apollo's Chariot? I would give this hyper coaster an eight and a half out of 10. If you love floater airtime, this is the coaster for you. Especially in the back row, Apollo's Chariot will have you levitating out of your seat on almost every hill. And the coaster is extremely re-rideable with those comfortable trains and the smooth ride. Combine that with a fantastic setting on a wooded hillside, and you have a winner. Apollo's Chariot does have three faults that I touched on. One, the back row is significantly better than the other rows, but you can wait for that row. Two, the turnaround section is boring. And three, the coaster doesn't have much variety. It's just sustained floater airtime. No positives, no laterals, no ejector airtime, just sustained floater airtime. If none of these things bother you, you will likely really enjoy Apollo's Chariot, just like me. While I do prefer B&M's newer hyper coasters and giga coasters over Apollo's Chariot, this is probably my favorite B&M hyper coaster built before 2012. I think the coaster was worthy of its high placement in the Golden Ticket Awards when it opened. Keep in mind the only hypers that existed at this time were the Arrow, Togo, and Morgan ones. And the hyper coaster Intamin opened that same year as Apollo's Chariot was the fun but flawed ride of steel. While Apollo's Chariot probably isn't worthy of that high placement anymore, it is still an incredible source of sustained floater airtime and an absolute delight to ride. It is my favorite ride at Busch Gardens, although that could change with Pantheon. So those are my thoughts on Apollo's Chariot, the original B&M hyper coaster at Busch Gardens Williamsburg. What are your thoughts on this coaster? How do you think it compares to the other B&M hypers out there? I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I'd appreciate if you gave this video a like and you considered subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster and music park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.